Now, <coughs> this class is supposedly on 19th century European philosophy. It is a philosophy class. So as a philosophy class, uh, there's something grating about simply taking up a given material defined in such terms that appear to be perhaps radically opaque to conceptualization, such as the 19th century, such as European philosophy. I mean, after all, the 19th century is bounded by periods that rest upon such purely contingent factors as rotation of our lonely planet around the sun, the, to some degree, dominance of a particular culture or civilization whose dominant religious tradition singled out a particular time period as the beginning of its calendar by which we have come to now the 21st century of the common era to be ecumenical, right? Uh, and then, of course, there's Europe, or European philosophy, a very contingent, historically given factor. And it seems that on all of these accounts, the periodization of the 19th century, the limitation of our consideration to European philosophy seems to be full of all sorts of arbitrariness, whereas as prospective philosophers were concerned with thinking what can be thought, what can be thought purely, what can be thought about what holds necessarily and universally. So we're really thinking about matters here that presumably are not bound to the planet Earth, would hold true of any philosophical developments of rational agents in galaxies far, far away, where uh, years have a completely different significance, where there is no such thing as Europe, where who knows what a 19th century might signify. But alas, and perhaps inevitably, um, if we're not going to reinvent the wheel, we are going to be looking at given philosophical texts questions which philosophical texts and why group together certain philosophical texts. Why do so in terms of, on the one hand, a particular historical period, and secondly, with regard to a particular, one might say, civilization or cultural orbit? Are these going to be the boundaries uh, which have some, some respect to philosophical significance? Or are we just dealing with an accidental smorgasbord of figures who have really no rational connection with one another? Now, in a sense, we're, we're called upon, if we want to treat things philosophically, to consider to what degree anything historical can be treated philosophically. And secondly, with regard to what extent the development of philosophical thought can be thought of as having any philosophical character of its own. So in some respect, we're, we're, we're summoned to try to think, is there anything about what happens to fall under the heading of the 19th century that can be philosophically grasped? And by the same token, whether there's anything about the particular figures we're looking at that have any philosophical connections with one another that are worth looking at. Now, of course, when we deal with individu individual given philosophical texts, uh, hopefully we're dealing with people who deserve to be read. That somehow we're not just dealing with individual idiosyncrasies, but somehow we are dealing with figures who have thought through fundamental options that must be thought through. And that therefore will have to be thought through whether we're talking about uh, the particular development on the planet Earth or in anywhere else where there may be any development of uh, a philosophical culture. Now what I want to do today is in a very preliminary way put before you uh, 
some notions which will themselves be matters of controversy in this course regarding what might be a philosophically conceivable character to events distinguishing the 19th century and by the same token distinguishing the philosophical developments that are represented by the three figures we're looking at, Marx, Nietzsche, and Hegel. Now, obviously, these could be looked upon as completely independent matters. It might be regarded that if there could be any kind of philosophical character to a particular historical period, that that might have no implications whatsoever for the character of the philosophical arguments that individuals make who happen to be inhabiting that particular time period. And after all, I stand before you as someone who's Who's, for whom the majority of my intellectual, mature intellectual development transpired in the 20th century. And by contrast, you, I think all of you, are such that your mature intellectual development takes place in the 21st century. And one might, might, perhaps, might perhaps make some arguments. So there might be some distinguishing features between these periods. Maybe not. One well, might consider does that have any impact upon what you were going to be thinking as opposed to what I'm going to be thinking because of where we stand. Uh, although we happen here to converge, uh, but our lifetimes are presumably very different in their trajectories. Uh, I'm in the you know, final closing stages of my intellectual development, whereas you stand before you know, the work that you are going to be doing. Well, it turns out that the thinkers who we are, we are going to be considered, considering not only inhabit, shall we say, successive generations of a particular historical period, but they all do indeed reflect philosophically upon the period that they inhabit. And they all regard the period they inhabit as having a very distinctive character and a character with which they are very much concerned. Now, what I want to do is to, is to sketch out two maybe very abstract, simplified ways of regarding what might be philosophical in the character of this 19th century and what might distinguish the different types of philosophical positions that Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche um, represent and how there might be some unity to this. Now, when I speak about the epoch that these three figures inhabit, they don't characterize it as the 19th century. They characterize it rather in terms of modernity, modern times. And they all recognize that modern times represent something of a special significance that is conceptually determinable. And they have rather different uh, ways of, of addressing and evaluating what might be considered modernity. But all of them consider it something of, of um, grave significance. And in many respects, uh, their thought is very much concerned with understanding the nature of this kind of world they inhabit. Now, one might ask, generally, how can philosophy possibly deal with what is historical? After all, what is historical is what is a product of convention. It's, in some respect, rooted in the arbitrariness of willing. And if you think about what the philosophers worthy of name have always done, none of them have ever attempted to philosophically determine a descriptive philosophy of history. They have never sought to determine what had to occur in history. Rather, I think you will find that, generally speaking, if philosophers have concerned themselves with historical development, it's always in regard to something normative. It's always something that is tied up with concern with what institutions ought to be 
once one has determined what institutions ought to be, then there's a consideration of both what has to occur for them to come into existence, and secondly, what can happen to them. as, in a sense, uh, a process of their dissolution. And after all, if there can be such a thing as ethics, if reason can determine what ought to be, then, conceivably, reason can take up the question of how what ought to be can come into existence. After all, what ought to be cannot be an unrealizable utopia. Right? What we ought to concern ourselves with must be something we can realize. So Marx will inveigh against any utopian socialism. That is an ideal that can't be realized, right? We're dealing with ethics. We're concerned with what can be realized. And for that reason, in thinking about what ought to be, uh, in some respects, we can always think about what developments have to occur for what is right to come to pass. Now, in this respect, when we turn to the question of modernity, if it is to be considered in any way philosophical, it's going to be something normative in character. It's going to be a project regarding a form of life that ought to be realized and that has something special about its character that allows itself to be something that can be regarded to have a kind of preeminence. Now, of course, when we speak about it as modernity, we're speaking about it as something that is not just a project that ought to be realized, but something that has at least begun to come into being in the times that we consider to be our own, if we are going to be speaking about modernity. Right? We're speaking about something that, at least to follow in the footsteps of Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche, is something that, at least in part, is in the process of emerging. And to say that, of course, is to engage in a judgment that isn't simply philosophical character. It's, it's a matter of judging empirical facts, but judging them in light of a concept that is philosophical, in light of something that is normative. Now, how might we characterize the modern in distinction to the pre-modern, or alternately to what might be considered the postmodern? Recognizing that all of these terms, in a sense, have something normative to them. Well, one central way in which modernity is distinguished as a project of civilization is that it is regarded as the kind of civilization that is unwilling to justify itself by simply appealing to tradition, by simply appealing to the way things have been or the way they are done or to any particular given features that might distinguish us, such as our given cultural relationships, our given linguistic uh, customs and the like. Instead, modernity calls the given into question and requires that what is to count is that which can stand up to the scrutiny of reason, and the scrutiny of reason is regarded to be a scrutiny that has to be autonomous. It cannot bow down to any authority. It cannot accept what is dogmatic. It's a scrutiny that exhibits an autonomous reason. And this scrutiny is going to turn out to sanction institutions that are themselves institutions of autonomy, institutions of freedom. And what will be peculiar about this embrace of autonomy and institutions of freedom, that's what alone can stand up to an independent rational scrutiny, is that freedom will be regarded as something that calls into question the given, that does not root itself in tradition, that does not root itself in nature, understood as that which is given. Instead, we're talking about a form of life that, in realizing institutions of freedom, is not going to have any foundations. And it will escape being rooted in foundations precisely because it will involve embracing and forwarding a way of life that is self-determined. It is not determined by any antecedent conditions, but it's in a sense, completely responsible for what it is and not bound by anything given independently of the exercise of its own autonomy. So here we're dealing with a form of life that, in a sense, could be said to be rootless. 
a form of life that is not a slave to tradition, a form of life that cannot be restricted to any particular set of conditions. It's a form of life that precisely because it embraces freedom and self-determination is going to involve institutions that are in principle globalizable, that are in principle realizable independently of the particular features that might distinguish given cultural groupings. Well, obviously this leaves open what indeed are these institutions. Uh, and it also leaves open, by the same token, to what degree our empirical understanding of what, in a descriptive sense, might be understood as modern times, involve the emergence of such institutions. But if you were to think of modernity as involving this project of civilization that is unwilling to bow down to tradition, to given foundations of any sort, but wants to consider what is worth embracing as only that which is justifiable by autonomous reason and turns out to be a form of life that is equally self-determined, then you have a sense of what pre-modernity might consist of. Pre-modernity will precisely be those forms of civilization that are rooted, that do have foundations, that are guided by antecedent tradition, that are particular in character. Now, obviously, to try to consider how the project of modernity is to be realized depends upon what these institutions actually consist in and what indeed autonomous reason really turns out to be. But generally speaking, if you think about modernity as being the project of a way of life that is intrinsically universal and global in character precisely because it is self-determined and not conditioned by any pre-existing state of affairs or cultural unities. Then if we're talking about pre-modernity, we're talking about forms of life, forms of civilization that are grounded in particular, that are rooted in particular tra traditions, that are not going to be global in character. And that, in a sense, tells you something about the emergence of modernity. If it's going to emerge, it's going to be emerging in a world which is full of different forms of communities that are defined by particular traditions, by particular cultures, by, well, one could say different linguistic communities and so forth and so on. And since there's nothing about these different communities that would lead them to necessarily overcome their own limitations, let alone to do so simultaneously, if one is going to speak about the emergence of a modern civilization, a civilization that wants to regard itself as being grounded not on tradition, but on the realization of freedom and rational autonomy. It's going to emerge out of a particular tradition. It's going to be emerging out of the, shall we say, revolutionizing of a particular tradition. And in doing so, it will emerge clothed by the remnants of that tradition. So if you want to think about this in terrestrial terms, at least in a way that I think Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche would, would all share, despite their differing views on, on these developments, there's a sense that if one wants to speak about how modernity arises, it's going to arise from a particular tradition. And it will, in a sense, you could say be regarded as a product of that tradition. After all, it emerges in that tradition. So that that civilization that has made itself modern will be a civilization that has adopted forms that are in principle universalizable and globalizable, <clears throat> but these have emerged in a particular cultural venue. So that, for example, one can think of 
in terms of uh, the history that we are uh, confronting. One can think of the first modern community being a community that could be considered to be Western, which might lead one to think of its emergence as being something that might appear to be linked to a particular tradition, even though what has emerged is a form of life that is in principle universal in character, precisely because it does not allow itself to be determined by any antecedent tradition, but instead regards its defining character to reside in being self-determined and being thereby subject to the test of autonomous reason. Now, once any such civilization has begun to, a, to arise on its own, it confronts the rest of the globe that could be said to be populated by pre-modern civilizations, which for it cannot have legitimacy, precisely because they do not exhibit relationships of freedom, but remain bound to customs, traditions, and so forth where conduct, as well as thought, are determined by all sorts of given foundations of one sort or another. So in a certain respect, this sets a kind of normative uh, opposition, where the first modern civilization finds itself confronted with simultaneously existing pre-modern communities. The traditions cannot be respected according to the very own strictures of what is autonomous. They can't be regarded as being inherently valuable, as inherently normative. Instead, they represent forms of oppression, which ought to be subject to a process of liberation. And simply in terms of that normative opposition, the universal character of this new form of civilization, in a sense, could find itself engaged in a project of modernizing, modernizing intelligent life as far as it is capable of being modernized. Now, since this process of modernization operates from a particular community that has independently modernized itself, it comes clothed with in a sense, that particular uh, clothing reflecting its particular tradition. So this process of modernization could appear as a process of westernization, even if there's nothing about modernity that would prevent it from equally appearing in a Chinese or Japanese or Indian or Indonesian uh, uh, community. Well, in any event, you can see that once the independently modernized modern civilization has begun to come into being, there's a certain kind of opposition that is created in normative terms. It may well also turn out that the very institutions that make up this modern civilization have a further dynamic of their own that leads them to not only be concerned with expanding themselves, but also give them, give them, give them, in a sense, types of resources that provide them with a kind of preeminence in terms of the ability to overturn pre-modern forms of civilization. Of course, that overturning of pre-modern civilizations, if they're pre-modern, is something that comes from without, it's a form of external modernization, which might appear to be clothed as a form of external westernization. And if you think through the very dynamic of this process, it clearly cannot take the form simply of an external modernization, because if what's at stake is the realization of institutions of self-determination, the process can only complete itself when the remnants of this external expansion have been replaced by the internal embrace of institutions of self-determination and the like. Well, one might say that the 19th century, 
is a period where one might be tempted to make the empirical judgment that, in terrestrial terms, a first modern community has come into existence in greater or lesser degree. And now a different sort of process is underway, where what is at stake is, in a sense, the struggle for external modernization, for the globalization of these relationships. A struggle that, on the one hand, will be contested by pre-modern civilizations, who in principle are antithetical to a civilization that subscribes to modern <coughs> principles. But then there also might be something that could be considered the opposition <coughs> of post-modern <coughs> civilization. One might ask, well, what would that involve? Well, it could involve the notion that although any civilization that grounds itself or roots itself in traditions or in some given particular features cannot legitimate its practices because the given always has some arbitrariness to it. After all, if you say, well, we're going to do it because it's tradition, then you have to ask yourself, well, why should tradition count? Why this tradition as opposed to any other? <coughs> well, one might take the view that there's no way of escaping the hold of arbitrary foundations. That after all, if we're going to make normative claims of any sort, whether it's regard to theory, practice, fine art, one always has to make appeal to reasons, to some kind of standards. But then the standards themselves call for some validation. But how are they going to be validated? Aren't we going to have to invoke some further standards? Is there any way of getting out of this problem? Well, if one were to regard it as a final problem that is insoluble, one could say, look, the nature of what goes by the name of rationality or normativity or the putting forward of values in any domain is something that always involves putting forward particular standards that can never be justified and that really what is at stake then is a power play where those who are putting forward their standards are putting them forward as norms, which is to say, as standards that have a universal binding authority to which all should subscribe or submit. But if these standards can't be justified, which is to say they're not rooted in reason, they're rooted in the will of those who put them forward. They've chosen, they've decided to put these standards forward. As a result, what are they doing in making normative claims? in putting forward notions of what's right, of what's true, of what's beautiful. They're shoving down the throats of all others their own chosen, arbitrarily chosen norms, which, well, come from them. And if we're going to find any basis for them, well, they're somehow to be found in the nature of that, that agency that puts them forward. They're somehow rooted in them, and nothing more than that. Well, this might call into question the attempt of modernity to come up with norms that are free of arbitrary foundations. This is being called into question by those who would want to say we can never escape foundations, but foundations are always arbitrary. So then, what is one to do? Well, one could, on the one hand, unveil modernity as being something that claims to have universal character, but is actually rooted in the arbitrary self-assertion of those who are putting it forward. Call it the West, which is just itself as particular as any other, uh, other civilization. And then you might ask, well, well, is there any way of choosing between any of these civilizational projects? Are we to opt for nihilism and skepticism? Or might there be a way of consistently putting forward values, recognizing that they're nothing but particular power plays. Well, one could regard this as a option of its own that might claim to have a superiority because it's consistent. It doesn't try to hold 
uh, hold in, uh, in obscurity what it's doing. It makes no bones about trying to dominate others and to dominate others in terms of its own particular self and project. Right? So one can think of a postmodern project fighting against the universal aspirations of this allegedly foundation for the civilizational project of self-determination, which instead represents the attempt of a particular community to advance its own particular values that it recognizes as being rooted in nothing other than itself and its own will, and shoving them down the throat of all others. Call it a recipe for the kind of politics that to some degree could be embraced by fascism in my century. Of course, could always be renewed in any century, perhaps. But here we set the stage for different kinds of oppositions. Pre-modernity versus the modern, the modern versus the postmodern. Now, some would want to say that Hegel is the thinker who um, defends the notion that, indeed, reason not only must but can be foundation for, can realize autonomy, and that uh, this becomes uh, the basis for an ethics of self-determination <coughs> involving the kind of institutions that might be regarded as coming into being and being fought over in modern times. And some have wanted to say that the Battle of Stalingrad was the slaughterhouse in which the Hegelian left, the Marxists, were facing off against the Hegelian right, followers of Nietzsche, and their Nazi uh, helmets and insignia. But we want to see to what degree uh, the prospect of the 19th century, the nature of modernity, the contests around the character of modernity, are indeed reflected, um, not only in the thought, but in what the distinguishes the, the three thinkers we're going to be looking at. Now, I want to, to take another um, avenue. I put before you some ways of perhaps thinking philosophically about developments that might be empirically realized, admittedly in ways that could be obviously contested and are contested by the thinkers we're going to be looking at, and to consider, well, what about the thinkers that we happen to have before us? Um, in what respect can we find in them not just arbitrary phenomena of intellectual history, but fundamental options? And philosophical thought that have to be considered. Options that are always going to be considered, irrespective of whether we're talking about our lonely planet or other outposts where there are rational creatures who are thinking. Well, if you think about the history of philosophy, um, there's some reason to think of it not being arbitrary in character that we're not just going to be dealing with a hodgepodge of, of, of figures whose thoughts have no relationship to one another. You can think back to Socrates, who might be regarded as someone who brings people to the point of engaging in philosophical speculation. After all, he is aware of his own ignorance. And as a result of being aware of his own ignorance, he has no answers to provide anyone. He can only question. Of course, if he can only question, he doesn't even know what questions to ask. He rather questions the claims being put forward by others. Of course, this process can go on indefinitely. And the only way he can question the claims of others is by seeing to what degree these other individuals who are making claims about virtue, about knowledge, and the like, can provide arguments in support of their claims. And of course, Socrates could never show that their arguments are true, because that would seem to require some kind of knowledge on his part. He could at least show that they're inconsistent or incomplete or lacking something. But in any event, there is a fellow Plato, a young man who speaks to Socrates, who comes to the point 
of being aware of his own ignorance, which is, after all, ultimately the only real intellectual basis for engaging in philosophical investigation, and who then comes up with not just questions, but, but answers. And because he has answers, he can write them down, he can teach them, he can have students, and lo and behold, one of his most uh, stubborn students, Aristotle, who studies with him for 20 years, uh, comes to the point of setting out on his own as, as a philosopher in his own right. How can he be a philosopher in his own right? Well, he's been immersed in the work of Plato. He finds certain things lacking in it. He engages in a critique of the philosopher who he considers to be the greatest that he knows of. He finds things lacking in Plato's arguments. So his critique of this predecessor gives him, in a sense, problems that have to be resolved. It gives him a direction, a positive direction. And for this reason, there will automatically be a kind of intrinsic philosophical bond between Plato and Aristotle. And so what Aristotle ends up developing as a remedy to the problems he uncovers in Plato will have a philosophical connection to what Plato does. And one could say that this will always be the case at least so long as we have thinkers who are aware of their predecessors, subject them to critique, and on the basis of that critique, have, well, certain kinds of problems that they are attempting to resolve. Now, when we turn to the likes of Marx, Nietzsche, and Hegel, we have figures who, in a sense, could be said to be part of successive generations. Hegel was born in 1770. He dies in 1831. Marx is born in 1880. He dies in 1883. By the time he's ready to go to university, Hegel has already died. So Marx will never <laughs> study directly under Hegel. But he will be someone who will read Hegel's work, some of the works. And much of his early writing consists of writing commentaries or taking notes on works of Hegel, in particular the phenomenology of spirit and Hegel's philosophy of right. Nietzsche comes along. One might say a generation later, born in 18, um, 1844, dies in 1900. Uh, and so one might consider, well, maybe we can think of these figures as giving us a philosophical <coughs> development that is philosophically uh, organized and, and determined. That in some respect we see Marx uh, working through Hegel, finding criticisms that he has to make, and that giving him problems that he has to address. Nietzsche responding to perhaps Hegel and Marx, perhaps, uh, if we want to think of these three figures, is not representing a kind of arbitrary smorgasbord of characters. Uh, but it's not clear if that's how things really work out. Um, and I think the ordering of this syllabus may reflect that, because as you can see, we're beginning with Marx, we're turning to Nietzsche, and then we're concluding with Hegel. Now, admittedly, Marx does deal with Hegel, and in some respects presents himself as turning Hegel upside down, or doing various things to, in a sense, correct fundamental problems that Hegel has undertaken. But I think you're going to discover that in, in fundamental ways, Marx never really comes to grip, grips with what is central and defining about Hegel's philosophical project. Although he deals with certain things in Hegel and does come up with criticisms that, that in a sense, can be shown to have, have significance, the fundamental thrust of what Hegel is doing is something that, in, in large respect, he's oblivious to. And the same thing could be said of Nietzsche, who almost never mentions Hegel by name seems at times to refer to something that might be related to Hegel or to the followers of Hegel. But likewise, it's not clear that, that, uh, that Nietzsche has really come to grips with Hegel in any fashion. On the contrary, I think you're going to find that Hegel comes to grips with the kind of positions that Marx and Nietzsche are purveying and presents us with powerful resources for really dealing with them. <coughs> 
so that there is going to be a certain kind of philosophical connection between these thinkers, but it will not quite be that of the ordering in which they happen to be born and died. I think in a certain respect, if one wants to get a sense of where, philosophically speaking, the respective thought projects of Marx, Nietzsche, and even Hegel are arising, one has to look to the philosophical developments that initially precede all three of them. One way of speaking about the, the, these, these projects is to talk about the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment might seem to be very much bound to modernity, because the Enlightenment, in a sense, enjoins us all to be autonomous and think autonomously, to call into question tradition and dogma. And in a certain respect, the Enlightenment does this by asking us all to think for ourselves. And at times, this means to think on the basis of what we are conscious of and to depend upon our own experience and the like. Now, perhaps the most philosophically uh, important representative of the thrust of enlightenment is Kant. And Kant, of course, is a figure with whom, indeed, Marx, Nietzsche, and Hegel are quite familiar. And Kant could be regarded as doing something that has something to do with modernity in the sense that Kant asks us to be critical and to not succumb to dogmatic philosophizing. Dogmatic philosophizing, which is characterized, one might say, all pre-modern thinking, has been content to address what is and read off the character of being. And to do this as what, in a sense, philosophy should begin with. Namely, one should begin by doing ontology. One should think about the character of being, trying to think about really what comes ultimately first in what is, which has to be thought in order to know what is, in order to understand how what is is itself internally constituted. But you know, Kant raises the question, well, how can one really begin authoritatively considering being or considering what is without first calling into question the authority of one's own thinking, one's own knowing? Doesn't one first have to turn and investigate knowing before one can investigate the objects of knowing? Mustn't one, one supplant ontology as first philosophy, that is a philosophy of being, of what is, and instead begin our philosophical explorations by turning to investigate knowing. Philosophy must begin by knowing knowing, by engaging in epistemology. Only then are we in a position to make any defensible claims about what is or the objects of knowing. Now, if you think about this fundamental turn, which might be said to uh, involve turning away from a dogmatic embrace of ontology or of addressing what is, it's not clear how turning to investigate knowing can provide us with any knowledge of whether knowing is true or not, whether what we claim to know has any bearing upon the objects of knowing, because if we can't independently access what is, how, in turning to investigate knowing, can we ever know whether our knowledge claims conform to what is? Well, if you think about it, the only way to turn to investigate knowing could possibly bear upon the truth of knowing, the objectivity of knowing, is if somehow or other the objects of knowing are determined by knowing itself, by the structure of knowing. <coughs> only if, in some respect, knowing determines what it knows can our turn to investigate knowing inform us on whether knowing can know its objects, because knowing will be able to know what it puts into its objects, what it determines its objects to be. And that we can grasp by turning to investigate knowing. Now, if one is to regard this as what it means to be critical, or what Kant would call to engage in transcendental philosophy, there's certain important ramifications. First of all, the object of knowing or knowable objectivity is going to be something determined by the structure of knowing. And the same structure of knowing is going to be determined, determining all objects of knowing. Well, that tells you that the objects of knowing are going to be 
in a sense, a world, a nature, an objectivity that is determined from without, that is subject to an external necessity. And moreover, because it's being determined by those same structures of knowing, they constitute, they give law to the objects to which knowing has access. Well, that tells you that the domain of, of knowable objectivity is going to consist of objects that are externally determined and determined in a way that because every object, every possible object of knowing is determined by the same necessity or structure, the necessities to which things are subject are going to be necessities that are indifferent to what they are, that are going to be indifferent to their own specific nature. The necessity, in other words, will not bear upon their form. It will bear upon what? Their matter. This will be an objectivity governed by laws of matter, an objectivity that will be a domain of mechanism where things are determined externally. And indeed, this, in a certain respect, becomes a prevailing view of what could be called the Enlightenment. That, in a sense, we regard knowable objectivity as very much a material mechanistic domain. But that, of course, poses problems. Because, in a sense, the knower whose knowing is determinative of the object of knowing is a knower who never itself can be an object of knowledge. Because the knower, or knowing that is determinative of or constitutive of the objects of knowing, is never itself an object. It determines what the objects are that it can know. It never falls within the domain of objectivity. It exercises a determining power, a kind of spontaneity, for which there is no place in the kind of nature or objectivity that it could be said to construct and that it can possibly know. Well, this sort of leads those who want to, in some respect, preserve the critical impetus to try to see whether it's possible to think about the knower as having a worldly presence. I mean, after all, if, if, if we can't know the knowing, if the knowing that determines the object of knowing cannot itself be an object of knowing, then we can't know anything about it. But the whole turn of transcendental philosophy is to know knowing. So in some respect, if we're going to know knowing, we have to think of knowing in a way in which it can be in the world. It can be objective. It can be an object. And so there's an attempt by those who might want to subscribe to this effort to try to give up the notion that the knowing or the structure of knowing is something, as Kant would say, noumenal or non-worldly, and to try to place the knowing that, in a sense, determines what it can know, to put it in the world. And to do so can involve various strategies. It can involve thinking about the knower as being a knower who is practically engaged in the world, in material relations of the world. A knower whose knowing, for example, is something that involves the very embedded worldly practice of language. Well, there are all sorts of ways in which you can think of an attempt to retain the critical impetus, not just go about reading off the character of what is, but to try to regard there being a knowing that is determinative of what it can know, but to regard that knowing as itself in the world, as something that can be known like the objects it plays a role in determining. But of course, if you take that route, then it might appear that the knowing in question takes on a particular character. It's a particular knower among others. It's subject to all sorts of particular conditions. Does that then leave our knowing itself particularized, itself conditioned, itself relative to those conditions? Are we then going to end up regarding knowing being subject to interests, subject to all sorts of practical concerns? So the theory becomes a matter of ideology serving all of those interests. Well, these are some of the roots that we're going to find exemplified in, in important respects in both Marx and Nietzsche. We see Hegel doing something, in a sense, much more radical that will involve abandoning the critical turn entirely, recognizing that there's something just as dogmatic about attempting to read off the character of knowing as attempting to read off the character of being. 
Well, we'll have to see what that involves. But what we're going to begin with is a look at some of the early writings of Marx. And when I say early writings of Marx, he was 27 when he wrote these texts. They never were published in his lifetime. Think of yourself, those of you who are less than 27, uh, a number of years from now, ask yourself, what would you be writing about? Would what Marx writes about be something that would have compelling significance for you? So I want you to look for next time at some of the works, these early works of Marx, beginning with the thesis on Feuerbach, and then the beginnings of the German ideology. And we're going to be thinking about Marx, what is the kind of uh, philosophical project, if we call it philosophical, that he's engaged in? And also keep in mind, what is, it, what is his appreciation of what might be considered identity? Because both of these issues are very much on his mind, and they'll become um, among our central considerations that we push on. Okay. Are, are there any questions that you have on what I've been putting before you? Okay, well, obviously, these are themes that we will be returning to over and over again. So make sure you've read the material for next time. Um, find a seat that you can stick with. Uh, I'll begin engaging you in conversation, uh, unlike today. <laughs>